Hey. Hey guys, so my name's Anurag. Uh, thank you to Percona for allowing me to speak to you. They asked me to talk to you about big data services and how Amazon and AWS approach uh, big data. Um, so, so who's AWS? I mean, I'm sure there's somebody in the audience who doesn't know us. So uh, we do cloud computing, which basically means we're a utility that provides computing, storage, and uh, database, networking, et cetera, in the, um, in the cloud, um, uh, over a million active customers. And I think the stat that I think is most interesting amongst this list up here is that every day we add enough new server capacity to support Amazon.com when it was a $7 billion global enterprise. Every day. And so, you know, over the last 10 years, we've learned uh, a little bit about uh, scalability. Um, big data really is all about scalability. And um, what, you know, I mean, there are a lot of definitions of big data. I think of big data as what, what do you have to do when the size of your data itself requires innovation around how you collect it, store it, process it, analyze it. So if you talk to various companies, the, somebody might say, hey, big data means big iron. You get a bigger box, right? And uh, you know, there was a time long ago when uh, we did that at uh, Amazon, and uh, we pretty quickly realized that you run out of steam on that approach. Another approach that people often talk about is that big data equals Hadoop, and basically scale it out wide you know, a big parallel hammer it solves all your problems. And, you know, a hammer will solve a lot of problems, but it doesn't necessarily solve all of them. In our view, we found that we had to approach um, a di a, this very differently. And so what I'm going to talk to you guys about is service-oriented architecture, which, I, which I'll use uh, big data as an example of how you can use it. But uh, I think it's something that you might be able to take back with you as you think about how you to design your own applications your own services, your own companies, et cetera. So if you look at uh, Collect, Store, Analyze, there are about 75, I think, services that AWS provides today. Here's a dozen that are deeply related to big data. There are probably a dozen more that are uh, somewhere there. What, um, what I'll do is I'll talk about um, a handful of these, um, where they fit in in terms of services, and then how you might collect them together to make a service-oriented architecture to solve uh, you know, your needs, and uh, how you might be able to think about that as you build your own stuff. So at the center of the stack is really S3. So we think of that as internet scale storage. You can uh, put a megabyte into it. You can put an exabyte into it. S3 doesn't care. Um, it 11.9's uh, durability. So you need really high durability if you're going to store exabytes of data. And at the same time, we provide all of those nines at three cents per uh, gigabyte month, which is our most expensive tier. <clears throat> so one of the things we noticed once people started storing data is, is that they really only analyze a tiny, tiny fraction of it. And uh, so that was what led us to, towards building Amazon Redshift, which is um, based on the realization that you know, basically data warehouses uh, prior to Redshift was where data went to die, right? We, as soon as people put their data in, they said, okay, I really can't let any more data come in here because it'll start to get slow. I can't afford to uh, manage it. I can't uh, you know, uh, deal with the scalability thing. So uh, Redshift, beyond being you know, the traditional you know, columnar MPP um, parallel uh, data warehouse, is fully managed. We take care of a lot of the... Uh, issues around backup and so forth, and we try to provide it at a fairly low uh, price of entry uh, compared to uh, other providers out there. Of course, a lot of people also like Hadoop. We do too, and so what the uh, so EMR provides a lot of the interesting, uh, you know, the uh, the Hadoop ecosystem. And I think, and again, fully managed. You'll see that as a recurring theme. The thing that we noticed about Hadoop. Uh, ecosystem is, is that if you look at people's uh, clusters for Hadoop processing, on average, they're running single-digit utilization. And that's a problem, right? I mean, however um, you know, much you're using uh, low-cost uh, nodes and you're just using nodes you weren't using anywhere, 
else uh, single digit utilization is really an issue. Whereas uh, with EMR, you're able to spin up clusters just when you need them, size them for just the job you want, and use maybe spot pricing where you get 90% discounts off of S3 and uh, off of uh, EC2 pricing, and you can use S3 as your backing data lake store. Going to services you may be less aware of, Lambda is a new service we announced recently where you can extend uh, your event processing logic with user-defined custom logic, paying for it at 100 uh, millisecond granules. Kinesis is based on technology we built in-house uh, to meter the millions of machines and billions of um, APIs we run and now available as a streaming service uh, for people. Uh, machine learning is sort of, um, Amazon ML is machine learning sort of for the rest of us where uh, it's, uh, the intent here is to be really simple. It's based on the same technologies we use in-house. And again, you can create models using your data already in S3. So this is about the time that people's eyes start to glaze over about the number of services I'm talking about. And uh, it sounds like, you know, maybe I do just want that one big service, the, you know, the big iron thing. Let's look at how the set of services structure together from a service-oriented architecture perspective and why that matters. So let's put it together from a cost perspective to start with. Let's look at what it might cost to process the Twitter firehose. So this is an architecture a lot of people could show you where you take your tweets, you process them through a streaming pipeline, in our case, Kinesis. You maybe take that to custom applications and compute. You maybe push it to a system like S3 for storage and eventually push it into some, a, a data warehouse like Redshift for you know, SQL analytics, right? The picture most people won't be able to show to you is something where you're paying three cents per, a little less than three cents per million puts two cents per hour for compute, 25 cents an hour for your data uh, warehouse, um, three cents per gigabyte month for long-term storage, and uh, a seventh of a uh, cent, uh, sorry, uh, seven-tenths of a cent for uh, cold storage. And so if you do the math on that, what that works out to is for roughly uh, half a billion tweets per day, uh, you know, if you run those numbers, it works out to a little less than three bucks per hour on demand. And what, that's really the first point I'll make about service-oriented architecture. Rather than the big iron sorts of approaches, you can use just the services you need. You can scale just the ones you need. So for example, you might say, I need this much uh, uh, support for streaming, but I need I want to keep my data for a longer period. So you, you, know, you can size them differently. And then you know, we also offer a lot of discounts with you for increased commit, commitment. So I'll also make the point here that cost sort of equals agility. So I know we've got some folks from Yelp here. Uh, so of course, you all know Yelp. You all use Yelp. Um, and uh, the example I'll give here is how Yelp does spelling correction. And so what they do is, is that they push their website logs into S3. They, every week, they spin up a 200 node EMR cluster, I think. They look at the entries into search. They look at what people finally clicked through. They figure that out as being a sense of misspellings. And they put that back into their web app. So for example, they might say, like, there are a lot of different ways that one might choose to spell Weston that are incorrect. Now the interesting thing about that is, is that that was originally an experiment that they ran. And in some sense, big data is about finding needles in haystacks, right? And so reducing the cost of failure enables experimentation. So at Yelp, any engineer can spin up an EMR cluster for a big data experiment. They run over 250 experiments per week. And the ones that pan out become features in their app. And the ones that don't, not such a big deal because it didn't cost that much. And so there's a real linkage between experimentation and innovation. There's a real linkage between cost and the ability to experiment. So why wouldn't you uh, go to this sort of model? Sometimes people talk about, well, you know, about, what about security? How do I control all these data and so forth? And so let's take a look at FINRA. So FINRA is the regulatory agency that basically uh, detects misconduct in the trading markets. They look at 30 billion market events every day to look at a holistic picture of trading. And 
you know, there are very, people innovate a lot in uh, the regulatory environment to, you know, manipulate the markets. And so it's a fairly uh, dynamic space for them. So they get their data from all of the various stock exchanges and the, and then they have a bunch of analysts and regulators watching it. They throw all of the data into S3. There's uh, petabytes of data being generated on premise and brought into AWS and stored in S3. And then they generate a bunch of uh, virtual private clouds, which are the equivalent of VPNs, to run things inside EMR and Redshift. And uh, they basically, through a combination of VPCs, VPNs, encryption at rest, encryption in transit, um, auditing, they're basically able to you know, create a more secure environment than they had before. And that's, I think, one of the key points about, as you look at trying to build service-oriented architectures, is, is that there are infrastructure components that need to be aligned. So for example, everything needs to sit inside the same sort of VPC kind of setting. Everything needs to be able to work off of the same key management systems. You need to be able to audit every API, every retrieval. You need to be able to control egress points across the board. So the other point I'll make here is, is that big data does not have to mean slow data, batch data. So DataZoo is a company most of you may not be aware of. They, do, uh, they provide an uh, ad exchange platform. Um, well over 100 terabytes of warehouse data. The slide's a bit stale. Um, maybe a million bid requests per second, billions of impressions per month, petabytes of log data. Here's the kicker. They need to have 100 millisecond round trip response time. The reason for that is, is that when you go to a web page, that web page is going to request an ad from an ad server. That ad server turns around and redirects to a series of ad exchanges, which sends it to real-time bidders. They each need to bid. The winner serves the ad. That needs to come to you. And it needs to come to you in around 100 milliseconds before you, you know, get tired of the page load time. And so the solution that DataZoo takes towards this is that they have a real-time bidding system. At, you know, it's a combination of on-premise and in the cloud. But they integrate that with a pretty complex machine learning environment, log ingestion environment, uh, data processing in EMR and Redshift that uh, allows them to construct the uh, basic uh, decision tree that they, do, that they use to decide whether to bid and how much to bid. And through that combination of environments, you can basically construct something such that big data can be interactive. You can stream data in, you can process it in real time. You can use the results of your calculations to respond quickly to requests. And then also the interesting of, uh, there is, is that they're mixing on-premise and cloud custom development managed services, their own infrastructure with uh, managed scaling and security. And um, that's finally my last point around this, which is that I think as you think about service-oriented architectures, it's important that these be pluggable components, not just with each other, but with whatever anybody wants to bring to the table. So for example, we also have a marketplace with uh, 2,000 product listings on it that people can just integrate with, deploy with one click, just as they would deploy another, you know, any of our own applications and get pay-as-you-go pricing on their Amazon bill, just as they would if it were an Amazon application. And that basically comes to the notion of having a retail mindset. You can go to Amazon, buy one of a thousand shirts. You can go to Amazon and buy one of a thousand big data services from us or from uh, others out there, uh, or build your own. And you know, at the end of the day, it's really important that people have that flexibility to build what they need, use what they want, and uh, you know, build their own applications. So that's really the uh, talk I wanted to give. I hope that gives you some thinking about how we approach uh, the big data platform. That's really how we approach pretty much you know, the retail platform and the other, all the other things that are going on um, at Amazon. And I think is the, really the way that a lot of application development is going to be happening in the future through microservices, web services, and uh, uh, piece components that integrate together. Thanks very much.